Fantastic. Uh, a really, really warm welcome to all of us, uh, all of you joining us today. So um, we have just under 30 people in the session today, and we have a few people who are still joining us from other sessions. So um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to, to all of you from uh, who are joining us from all over the world today. It's really great to see you here, and thanks. Uh, we had so many great sessions uh, during the Climate Red event today, so thanks for choosing to be with us for uh, the next 90 minutes or so. Um, I wanted to pr provide a little bit of framing for today's session and to give an overview of what we're gonna be covering today. And then I'm gonna introduce our, my co-presenters and panelists for today. Um, but I wanted to start with, with just one bit from the ambitions document, uh, which some of you may have read on the Climate Red website in anticipation of today. Um, and I'm just gonna read the first sentence from that. Climate change is a humanitarian emergency. Today, one weather or climate related disaster occurs every one to two days. And in 2018, there were an estimated 108 million people needing life-saving assistance. To really understand the risks faced by each place um, and to begin to reduce those risks, we first need to understand each place. Where do people live? Where is the key lifeline infrastructure? Where and what are the community assets? What are the risk factors? How do you actually capture all of this information? Is it through community volunteers, through satellites, drones, surveys? And now imagine the complexity of trying to capture all of this knowledge for just a single community um, and scale that up to think bigger for an entire country. And now imagine trying to capture it for the entire world. And this is what we're working on. This is the topic of today's session. Yes, we will talk a bit about satellites today, but we want to focus on the forum through which we're all collaborating to map the world. And that forum is called Missing Maps. The platform we use to do the mapping is called OpenStreetMap. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with OpenStreetMap, when you think about OpenStreetMap, think for a minute about Wikipedia. Wikipedia has a vision in which every single human being can freely share in the sum of all knowledge. In our case, we focus on freely sharing in the sum of all knowledge about our physical world. And if we want to create such, such a world and such a reality, we need to make sure every person in our world can contribute their local knowledge to the map, just like you would contribute to a Wikipedia article. And this also includes making decisions on when not to be mapped, when not to add uh, a home or community to the map. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the global OpenStreetMap community has done a lot of mapping. 250,000 people have contributed to humanitarian mapping in OpenStreetMap. And it covers a lot of the world right now. If you try locating some of the world's largest refugee settlements in Google Maps, for example, and then have a look in OpenStreetMap at those same places, you'll see what I mean. But we have a big challenge. We estimate that 1 billion people living in places facing high disaster risk and those especially vulnerable to climate change are still not fully represented on the world's map. What are the implications of this? We are trying to understand climate's impact on our physical environment, but we don't have a complete picture of that environment. Entire neighborhoods, villages, and towns are represented only by a name or sometimes just the intersection of two major roads. Now, if you're sitting in New York or Geneva today, you probably couldn't imagine opening up your favorite map app on your smartphone and seeing a big blank gray area. Um, but this is the real reality for much of the world's population. And it's, it's certainly not the world's biggest injustice, but it is an injustice nonetheless, and we, one that we believe is solvable and by solving it, uh, will contribute to more effective climate action. So that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, we've, we've heard time and time again, um, and this is the case, that disaster risk reduction, response, and recovery should begin and end locally. We know that the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement has a special advantage here, uh, being present in communities before, during, and after emergencies. And missing maps as a movement takes advantage of this, connecting thousands of online map volunteers with local Red Cross, Red Crescent um, Ch uh, chapters and, and national societies, and the OpenStreetMap volunteer community in more than 50 countries. 
local volunteers, branches, and national societies lead, and the international mapping community supports the effort. So this is a very concrete method, uh, looking going back to the ambitions document of, uh, of achieving approach C, which is strengthening our expertise and volunteer base to reduce the impacts of the climate crisis. Um, so as we get into today's session today, I just wanna leave us with a few thoughts. Uh, ourselves, uh, our panelists, my co-panelists for today, uh, representing the Red Cross movement and my organization, Humanitarian Open Street Map Team, have demonstrated the power of open mapping and open street map for emergency response and recovery. We've utilized it during approximately 100 emergency responses. However, there's an enormous potential to do even more than response by mapping in advance of disaster. Uh, and by doing so, we can unlock the power of open street map for climate change adaptation uh, long-term planning and anticipatory action. So today you'll hear from my colleagues, speakers across the spectrum representing uh, various parts of the movement um, and also my organization, HOT. A big part of today's session is also hearing from you, our, our participants. We want to hear your ideas and we need your ideas on how to extend this mapping movement to your country. Um, so let's now turn it over to our speakers and I'll, I'll introduce our speakers for today. Um, from left to right, and I'll ask them just a really brief question to introduce themselves. So first, um, from the Red Cross, Red Crescent Climate Center, we have Catalina Jaime, who's a senior risk advisor, and Catalina is going to talk today a bit about the importance of mapping for climate action. So Catalina, to introduce yourself, tell us about your, your in a sentence or two, what's your favorite map and why is it your favorite map? Yeah. Hey, Taylor. So I'm really delighted to be with all of you in this session. Um, and okay, my favorite map is a one that I have in my daughter's room. When she was born, I was desperate to have a really cool world map, but that was kind of like baby friendly kind of thing. So it's a beautiful map with all the different animals that represent different regions of the world. So that's my favorite map. Catalina, thank you so much. Um, next, I'm gonna go to my colleague, David Luswata, who's a programs manager at Humanitarian Open Street Map Team. Uh, David's gonna tell a little bit of his personal story of how he got into mapping and what we mean by the title of today's session uh, that we're missing a billion people. So David, over to you, what's your favorite map and why? Thanks, Taylor, and uh, good to have all of you participants joining us today this talk and this session. My favorite map actually is one that I studied um, in primary school and this map was showing um, different countries in Africa uh, with physical features and I really really was interested in always seeing the river Nile flowing, flowing uh, on that map and cutting across the continent um, of Africa. David, thank you very much. Um, next, I'm gonna go to uh, my colleague, Elijah Kingori at IFRC, um, who serves as an information management officer. Uh, Elijah is gonna talk a little bit later about some examples from the Red Cross movement around how maps um, and OpenStreetMap are being used. Elijah, over to you. Um, tell us about your favorite map. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, and uh, I'm so excited to be here, and uh, excited to see everyone. I think uh, my favorite map is uh, is uh, it's uh, one of my, one, one of the maps here in Kenya. I think it was the last map that I well I was sitting for my last exams here in uh, in high school, so I still have that map. So uh, it so they can see from my last paper in uh, geography. Elijah, thank you. And we, your connection was just a little bit choppy at the end there. So maybe when we're talking later, my, I'm not sure if it'll work better without video, um, but thanks Elijah. And I'm, last but not least, I'll go to uh, Katerina Lorenz, who's a geoinformatics advisor at German Red Cross. So Katerina, over to you. Uh, tell us about your favorite map and why. Thanks, Tyler. I think that's quite a tough question. I'm a cartographer by trade. So I think it's very difficult for me to pick one map. But thinking about open street map and missing maps and how the data is created in the first step, you know, tracing satellite imagery and so on. I think one of my favorite maps is a map that Leonardo da Vinci created of the Italian city of Imola, 
And what's so great about this map is that it's one of the first maps that moved away from showing a city in the bird's eye view, but showing it, you know, like he would see, you would see it now from a satellite image. And of course, Leonardo da Vinci didn't have a satellite image to create this map. Mm -hmm. So it must have been really time consuming for him to go around, you know, and measure every angle, every length of every building to create such a detailed and, you know, rich informative map. Hmm. Um, Katrina, thank you. And for all of us, I think it's a good uh, sort of history lesson and maybe something we can talk more about today around how things have changed uh, over the past few hundred years. Let's go to um, hearing from all of you. We want to know, we've introduced our panelists and we want to hear from each of you. And we're going to do just a little bit of a, um, a quick poll. Um, so let me, if I could, I'll share, try to share my screen. Apologies, we're, we're, we are getting there. Um, okay, we'd like, all right, we'd like to start with this question, which best describes you? And what we want you to do is on your laptop or your phone, um, please go to menti.com and you can enter the code that appears on the top of the screen here. And tell us a, a little bit about yourself. And I see, I saw one vote coming in so far. So it looks like you, it looks like you are all getting in there. Great. Yeah, and if you're still getting there, the code menti.com, the code is 42252. Um, great, yeah, this is really fantastic. So we have quite a mix of, of participants on the call today. We have many staff members from the Red Cross and Red Cross and Movement uh, organizations. Five Missing Maps volunteers, one Red Cross volunteer, six, uh, six of you coming from universities or students, and a few people coming from other NGOs or Red Cross, Red Crescent partners. Okay, we're gonna go to the next question. Where are you joining us from today? Same website, same code. Okay, it looks like Europe is, is overrepresented, but uh, welcome all our colleagues joining from uh, every region today. Let's, I'm going to move to the next question. Uh, what do you hope to share or learn from today's session? Just tell us in a phrase or a sentence. Okay, finding, finding the missing billion, the tech, best technologies to use, how mapping can help with climate action, importance of open street map for climate action, know more about missing maps, great. Uh, migration. Great, and I'd, I'd invite all my co-presenters today to um, 
see if you can touch on some of these topics in your presentations today or when we have our discussion. Okay, fantastic. So th thanks everyone for introducing yourselves. Um, what I wanted to do next is several of you had asked about the connection between OpenStreetMap and climate action. So I'm curious to hear from my colleague Catalina a little bit more about what that means exactly. Um, before I get to that, we're just going to show a really quick video about what we're talking about today when we talk about OpenStreetMap and we talk about mapping. Um, and then Catalina will turn it over to you after that. So first, um, Ben, if you could help cue that video. OpenStreetMap.org is a free map of the world that anyone can edit. Thanks Wikipedia, but for maps. OpenStreetMap allows anyone to view, add, edit, and use map data of anywhere on Earth. It's free and open source, meaning there's no cost and very few restrictions on how you can use the data. That makes it very popular with humanitarian organizations, community groups, local businesses, and governments alike. One of the great things about OpenStreetMap is that if something is missing from the map, you can add it. Geographic data is lacking for many parts of the world, and OpenStreetMap allows anyone to add to the map. Then everyone else can see and use that information. That can be very empowering. Local communities can add what's important to them to the map, since every place is different. Maybe it's schools or hospitals, bike trails or dog parks, roads or buildings, or any number of other things. And since OpenStreetMap is free and open source, anyone can use the map to make decisions, plan projects, and work in their communities. OpenStreetMap was started in the UK in 2004 when its founder, Steve Coast, had a hard time finding maps and geographic data he could use. It's grown to include millions of contributors from all over the world. OpenStreetMap has since been used in many humanitarian and disaster situations as well, as people on the ground and volunteers from all over the world can quickly trace map data using satellite images which aid in humanitarian groups can use to deliver relief supplies, plan their work, coordinate with each other, and a lot more. Businesses also use it for a variety of things, including turn-by-turn -turn navigation for vehicles, maps to their locations, traffic and transit apps, and a lot more. Contributors add data to OpenStreetMap in a few ways, using GPS units and phone apps, by tracing satellite images, and by simply visiting a place themselves and recording their local knowledge. Most contributors to the map are volunteers. Something else great about OpenStreetMap is that it's easy to use. Just sign up, follow the tutorial, and you're on your way. Let's get started. Great. Um, so Catalina, we heard in the video a few thoughts around using maps to make decisions, to plan projects, how humanitarian groups, um, so to speak, are using the maps. And we also saw some photos of uh, Red Cross staff and volunteers working on the ground, doing something with maps that looked like GPS devices. What does this all have to do with climate action? Can you t tell us a little bit more about that? We heard about emergency response. What about climate action and anticipatory action? What's the link? Yes, Taylor, thank you. So as you know, and many some of you uh, here, I'm, I'm a big believer of the power of OSM for climate action. No lies. It's clearly that we can go beyond what we're doing now. No, like we're very used at the moment to map for response. We do these amazing mapathons every time that we have an emergency and mobilize like volunteers all over the world. And, and there is so much potential to do that even in advance to actually to be able to contribute to long-term adaptation, disaster risk reduction, to, to really utilize the wealth of, of, of data that it could offer. So in the, in the Red Cross and Red Cross and movement, and you might have heard in, in some of the earlier sessions, we have a, a very important document, which is the, the ambitions of climate action for the movement. And there are four key elements on this, on this key doc, document, which is like what, what we want to basically head towards. So from one side, we want to scale up climate smart disaster risk reduction with early warning and early action and preparedness. We want to also focus on reduce health impacts of climate change, address class climate displacement, and, and also in the more length, long term, enable climate resilient livelihoods and sustainable water resource management. And 
with all that you know, like mega ambition, you might think for a second, but like, what exactly can OSM offer to do this? And the answer is actually, is a lot. Like, it's just huge. Like, what, what we could do as an as a, as a OSM and Missing Maps community and like records community to contribute to this. Because ultimately, what this type of data offers is an opportunity to understand risks, which is one of the big gaps that we have to be able really to develop plans to really know exactly how we can support like people that have different type of risks, really understanding at that granular level, you know, at, at a very large scale, exactly who is likely to be impacted, who lives where, which are the houses that could be damaged, which are the water points that could be damaged, the crops, etc. It's basically a, a massive opportunity that OSM kind of like offers. But very concretely, you know, like we, we think about climate action and, and what we could do, it's clear, the better the map and the larger the map and the granular the map for regions and cities and villages and so on, I mean, the better will be our capacity to plan. Like we will be able to have better climate change adaptation plans, you know, like we can like really plan in more detail uh, the specific uh, adaptation activities to reduce those different uh, like type of risk. And in particular, one topic that is very close to my heart, which some of you might know, uh, if we look at the different time scales, no, we can do a lot of actions that are in the long term, but we can do also actions in the very short term based actually on weather forecast. So, so for us, the use of a uh, open street map offers like the opportunity to be able really to develop an anticipatory system or what we call focus-based financing systems to be able you know, to know who is likely to be affected if I have X or Y forecast for different type of climate related hazards. So the point is that we have been doing this for quite a long time. Like we have been, I mean, the, the, massing, the missing mass project is like the most beautiful thing you know, like that the movement has uh, and, and there are volunteers all over the world that are already trained uh, and, and the work that we do very closely with the, with, uh, the humanitarian open street map team is just brilliant. But we know that we're not yet at the scale that is needed. If we, we still have like pockets of projects here and there, but if we want really to take up the scale that understanding a risk, we need to have a massive black mapping effort to really be able to, to get to the point. So let's just, just the last message uh, that Nola is like a dream that we have been discussing with like many of my colleagues. Uh, it's like, I mean, let's imagine a humanitarian system, no, let's say particularly in the record regression, it was like every single volunteer is training OSM, knows how to you know, like utilize the different tools, either it could be the, the, the digital volunteers that we have, field volunteers, but like mapping, like just becomes a regular activity of, uh, of our volunteers. With that, we will be able to contribute to, to this scale that we're talking about. So with that, uh, Taylor, over to you. Adelina, thank you very much. And I, I, we want to get to, you, you know, you mentioned a couple of really critical things around our ability to better plan and uh, make decisions uh, re related to adaptation for climate change. I think later in the session today, you're going to hear you're going to hear just in a moment from three um, additional speakers who are going to talk about really specific examples of that. Um, and Catalina, you you mentioned to me earlier you wanted to get um, you know in our poll earlier we showed that we have many Red Cross Red Crescent movement staff here on the on the on the call today. What would you like them to be thinking about as we go through today's session? Um, and I know you'll cover this a bit later. Um, but if you're joining us from a national society or from uh, from the federation or or from another entity, what what are some things to keep in mind as we go through the session today? So I think one of the the great things that we will see later with Katarina and David and Elia is basically what we have done so far. You no, know, there are like really fantastic examples of uh, like really brilliant projects and, and, and things that we have done. So one of the key things to think about through the session is, I mean, how can we 
integrate these ideas with the national societies that maybe are not yet involved. You know, like how me as a person that is participating in this, uh, like in this session can actually take the leadership either with the IFRC or the national society to kind of like think about OSM as like one of these extra elements that will contribute to climate action. So really kind of like embrace the idea that this is something that like all of us, you know, like could do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and I, I think that's an important takeaway from today's session is that it, it is something all of us can do. Um, we're really lucky to have some cartographers with us today, so Katerina, um, but you don't need to be a cartographer to map, and we're going to talk more about that. So first, let me turn it over to my colleague, David Luswata, who's going to talk a little bit from the humanitarian open street map team perspective. So David, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Taylor. Perfect. So I'll go ahead and uh, share uh, my screen. I have a few slides that I, I want to talk through as uh, we go through uh, this, this session. And I just want to talk about the evolution of HOT and um, the recently um, the recent project that we've got at HOT uh, that is the Audacious project and what that means for humanitarian mapping and the different uh, stakeholders and partners that we have in the missing maps movement. So um, the story of HOT indeed uh, started 10 years ago and it's uh, when there was that earthquake in, in Haiti, um, much of the capital uh, port of prince was was uh, destroyed in that earthquake um, there was a need for humanitarian responders to you know have information to use to uh, respond to this disaster that happened and i think many of you um participating here today could have heard about that earthquake but that's just one story of so many um disasters that are going on around the world um, what we took away from that is that that's when uh, these humanitarian responders, uh, organizations uh, came together and uh, because of the need that was really existent at the time of updated information, information that can be used to actually respond to these disasters, the humanitarian open street map team was uh, created. And uh, this very year we, we celebrated uh, 10 years of existence. Um, which is a story of all of um, the very many community members that have been participating and um, contributing to the map, creating data that is actually very helpful for humanitarian um, agencies that are responding. And since then, it's been working with the uh, OpenStreetMap platform, which is the platform we continue to populate to add data to. It is actually a very um, useful tool that many humanitarian agencies are finding very relevant to their work. Government agencies are actually turning to that uh, um, platform, um, the academia, and several other use cases. And at HOT, we've continued to um, design many of our programs and projects around uh, enriching this map that it will be actually helpful for very many humanitarian responders. And all of you, all of us can actually sign up very quickly um, and start ad uh, adding data to, to this very map. In the process, uh, 10 years and going now, um, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team has been using OpenStreetMap to primarily respond to disasters or create information that is used to respond to disasters. Um, talk of flooding, like you, you can see, this is a photo we took in um, Monrovia, Liberia. Uh, in this particular community, dog community, you, could, you can see that actually that road is the boundary between this community down at the river edge and then the other community, but most of this community is, is flooded. Um, the mapping work we're doing there was to work with local communities themselves, uh, the local residents of this area to map and uh, add this data on the map uh, at the, the location of buildings um, and other services that are actually present in this area. This information is then used by several um, government agencies, particularly to bring more services to these areas, but also um, it can be used for economic development. And some of the projects that we've worked on indeed have been to support 
economic development. Uh, that is more of a use case with the government agencies and uh, some uh, development partners that uh, do carry on several pro projects or programs in different parts of the world. But this is not the only story. We've been um, working on several other projects and programs and much of our work really has been um, building and it's really building around the OpenStreetMap platform that one um, programs like malaria elimination can use the data that we create um, working with different volunteers and, and staff um, to create this data in OpenStreetMap. So we've had um, several projects in, in uh, relation to malaria elimination um, in, in the Caribbean, in, in Southern Africa, and all of these projects have actually um, contributed to the fight against uh, malaria and many of these countries, many of the countries indeed, uh, working to uh, bring malaria to an end in their countries. Um, the other projects have been around uh, flooding, and this has been, uh, with, when you talk about climate change, this is a big topic, flooding. Um, many of the locations we've worked in in Kampala, the story is almost the same. People want this to end, and uh, this can only end if we take action as um, the you know, citizens of, of, of Mother Earth. So uh, these projects that we're working on um, have built the capacity of local communities, uh, students, um, uh, national partners to put many of these uh, locations on the map. And it's the same story with disaster resilience uh, in Indonesia or the Philippines. All of this is to help local agencies and the local communities to work together and uh, put their communities on the map creating data that can be used for responding to disasters when they occur. This indeed has been our story going uh, forward, spanning the last uh, um, 10 years. Uh, and last year, our community came together and developed a strategic plan. And in that plan, we really wanted to see that everyone is counted and that map data is accessible and can be used to make decisions that save and improve lives everywhere. So the idea then was that everyone can be engaged to contribute to this map. This strategic plan that we developed has uh, eventually led to um, one of the biggest projects we've had, and uh, that is actually a benefit, going to be a benefit for um, the entire world. Um, in that particular project, it's by uh, the Audacious uh, project. Uh, we do want to um, map an area home to one billion people not just as, as, humanitarian, uh, as the humanitarian um, OpenStreetMap team, but working with as many uh, stakeholders and partners that we can work with to put this one billion people on the map across 94 countries. And the way we'll be able to achieve that is to work with um, maybe more than a million, a million volunteers, but our target at this point is to engage um, one million volunteers to work together across these different uh, countries, uh, 94 countries, to put uh, people uh, on the map. <clears throat> and uh, we, the way we are going to do this is, is just building on our experience that we've really generated in the last um, uh, 10 years, uh, where we've indeed been focusing on micro-grants. We've, we've been having micro-grants uh, that we give out to different communities and different uh, uh, groups of people. We do want to scale that up in this audacious project in that these are communities of people, groups of people, and it could be national societies as well. We'll get these grants and working together with our teams and the different OSM communities, then we can be able to map uh, these different uh, people and locations and add them on the map. The goal is to be able to have 94 grants. This time around, we are thinking and uh, working on having um, the, the amounts a bit larger than what we've been giving in the past uh, and providing additional support to these grant, grantees to be able to um, make the most out of these grants and uh, add communities on the map. Um, in that, we will be actually setting up regional hubs around the world and um, this is what we'll be looking at, setting up four regional hubs, one in East Africa, in West Africa, um, in the Latin America and the Caribbean, and then uh, in Asia Pacific. All of these regional hubs will be working with local communities and, and, and staff of, of HOT to 
put people on the map across these 94 countries. Um, and this is the story. This is uh, building where we've come from to what the next five years look like, uh, in which we'll be uh, working together with community members, Red Cross volunteers, and other stakeholders to put uh, the most vulnerable people and locations on the map. This is really important for uh, government agencies or humanitarian responders to be able to bring the needed help when disasters strike. And I do want to uh, stop here for, for this session. Thank you, Tyler, over to you. David, thank you very much for your presentation. I think one of the re really important points you touched on is that um, this is not about humanitarian or open street map team or any one organization. This is really about um, needing to wor all work together through through a consortia, which we call Missing Maps, and through uh, engaging one million volunteers. And we really need help from everyone who's joined us today to be able to do that, to be able to achieve these big objectives. Um, and so next we're gonna go to Elijah Kingori. So Elijah, um, his, Elijah's organization, so Elijah works for the Federation and IFRC is a, is a member of Missing Maps. Um, and in his role serves as coordinator for Missing Maps uh, for uh, on behalf of the, the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. So Elijah, we're going to go to you next and tell us a little bit about some of the specific uh, examples you've seen in, in missing maps being used throughout the movement. Over to you, Elijah. Uh, thank you, Sheila. Uh, let me just share my screen. I uh, hope uh, it's visible to everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, uh, as Atul has mentioned, I'm Elijah from FRC. Uh, I'll touch base on uh, how national societies uh, have leveraged and uh, missing maps to meet our data preparedness and response needs while embracing the spirit of digital volunteerism using uh, missing maps and as well using mapathons. Uh, I'll just uh, touch base on a few national societies, uh, basically Malawi and Lagos, but there are more, there are more national societies which uh, have been using missing maps uh, during uh, disasters as well as uh, preparedness and as well, uh, on, and as well as volunteer as well. Uh, so I'll start with Kenya Red Cross. Uh, just a few, maybe before I begin, I can say uh, maps have really shaped uh, how national societies are able to respond to disasters, are able to take early actions when it comes to disasters and as well for preparedness purposes. And uh, it has been seen uh, through Kenya Red Cross here in Kenya. Uh, Kenya Red Cross has always been on the forefront when it comes to disaster response and as well preparedness. Uh, what you see at the moment on the, on the, on the, what you see at the moment is a, is a, a picture of national, this, was, this is during preparedness uh, preparation by the national societies whereby the, the map you see on the right side is whereby there was a map pattern by the national societies mapping areas that are prone to, to floods. And this is the area that you, and this is the area that are, was highly expected to be affected by floods. So what they did is that they hosted a map pattern in the national societies whereby they invited volunteers to be able to map, to be able to map and digitize roads and, uh, and buildings that are highly likely to be able to to be affected by the flood in the area. And next day, uh, before that, before that uh, just to conclude on the National Society Kenya Red Cross. So what they did is uh, they engaged volunteers in the map pattern whereby volunteers were able to map areas that are houses uh, for accessibility, houses that are likely, that are able likely to be affected by the floods and as well roads for easy accessibility. And uh, the picture on the right, uh, on the right side, these are the this is the national societies engaging the communities, showing whereby where they are high, the the, the riparian runs where they are high likeliness to be affected by the floods. And uh, the next one is the uh, Malawi Red Cross. Uh, during 2015, uh, there was a flood that uh, took place in Malawi, and before that, uh, the national societies took the initiative whereby to be able to 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 engage volunteers in mapping initiative through missing maps and open street map to to map the area that was highly to be affected by, by the flood. And you see here on the, 
Now this is a 2016 map, uh, which now they produced showing areas that are well, mostly houses that have been affected by, by the floods. And you can see the volunteers and staff from the national societies doing ground truthing on the ground, trying to see where the actual houses that, are, are, that were affected after the 2015 floods and so that they can be able to so that they can be able to assist the affected people during the recovery period and uh, sorry for that during the recovery period and then uh, so maps have been have uh, enabled have enabled as uh, have really helped to understand the hazard exposure and as well the vulnerability of the and coping capacity uh, so the, so map have really helped have really helped national societies understand hazards that is in climate climate change perspective and as well the be able to map the most vulnerable people in the areas and as well be, be able to be able to identify population that can affect population in areas that cannot be able to be accessible to it through missing maps and as well through open stream map and as well through engaging volunteers. Uh, lastly I'd like to lastly I'd like to touch a basic on embracing embracing digital volunteerism using using missing, using, missing, using mapping. This is where national society has, has taking initiatives by engaging volunteers using using mapathons and uh, ground truthing processes. These are another way of, of, of national societies engaging volunteers in national societies, not only for data but as well building their capacities in in mapping, but uh, and as well building the capacity of national societies and. Uh, this has really empowered national societies to deliver to deliver localized quality programs and services with, with volunteers and in collaboration with local partners. Uh, lastly, in conclusion, I'll, uh, I'll uh, finish by this quote: "Maps has really have codified the miracle of existence, and it's evidence. Map that map do, map 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 only communicate by just saying, and with a map, a map says a lot without even saying a word." Thank you. Back to you, Taylor. Elijah, thank you very much for your presentation. You mentioned mapathons in your presentation. What, for anybody on the call who, who maybe has not experienced a mapathon in the past, tell us what that is. Uh, thank you, Taylor, for that. Uh, mapathon, it's a, it's a, I can say it's, a, it's, a, it's more like a party whereby no one, you don't have to be a mapper, you don't have to be an expert in mapping, but all you come together is it's more like a, a mapping party where people come together to be able to map areas that are using OpenStreetMap. So it's all open to everyone. People coming together and people using OpenStreetMap, volunteers, anyone from any field of, of, of career can be able to come and using, using either the, what you only need is a laptop and the internet, and then you can be able to map anywhere and you can be able to add locations, map building and digitized areas that you feel that vulnerable and, and as well that can make impact with the data that you'll be able to map. Thank you, Taylor. Elijah, thank you very much um, for your presentation. We're gonna go next to Katerina from German Red Cross, uh, who's gonna tell us a little bit about how things have been working within, um, within the German Red Cross, but also help us maybe think about future potential or what could be next. So Katerina, over to you. Thanks, Tyler. Right, so we've heard from our previous speakers already how important geospatial information is and what, what a really important role it plays in the humanitarian system, be it for decision making, coordination, communication, etc. And we've already heard that missing maps can be one of the tools that helps us close the gaps if there is a lack in geospatial data. German Red Cross is one of the newer members of the Missing Maps membership, and I just would like to talk a bit about GRC's approach to volunteer engagement. Um, in order to do this, I would like to recap on the different steps that we have in the Missing Maps campaign. In the first step, we've got remote volunteers that come together and they use satellite or aerial imagery to trace objects into OpenStreetMap. In the second step, we've got the community volunteers then in country using this base map produced in step one and adding context specific information to this base map, be it road names, um, building usage like hospitals, schools. And then in the third step, 
all this data, as it is an open street map, is made available for everyone to use. As you can see from step one and step two, um, volunteers are a very crucial factor in the success of a Missing Maps project. Um, and Missing Maps offers a number of opportunities in motivating volunteers to join national societies. And the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement is a volunteer-based organization which relies heavily on the global network of volunteers. Um, the movement has always offered various training programs for you know, first aid, search and rescue, and yeah, other training programs respective to the different national societies. But I think we all need to be aware of that um, these trainings might decrease in their attractiveness, especially when it comes to young people or urban areas and so on. And that digital tools can play here an important part to increase this attractiveness um, for new, yeah, to attract new volunteers to the movement. Um, I now would like to talk more about step one, basically the creation of the base map and how we are rolling this out here at the German Red Cross. So me as the Missing Maps coordinator, I'm based within the international cooperation and we decide, you know, which projects um, require mapping support. At the moment, we are focusing on the projects Catalina touched upon, forecast-based financing, um, play a very big role at the moment. Um, and the projects that we are mapping there um, rely heavily on missing maps. And missing maps is not new, and on, also the whole concept of Mappathon is not new in Germany. You know, we've got the disaster mapper Heidelberg, who's been uh, conducting Mappathons for a very long time, and also other uh, organizations in Germany, but it was a new concept for the German Red Cross. And we've started to roll out um, a series of mapathons in our different chapters, Germany being probably slightly different because of its federalistic structure than other Red Cross um, organizations. So we've got um, our state chapters, which uh, consists of different district chapters, who then consist again of several local chapters. And of course, we've also got the youth chapters. So together with the Heidelberg Institute for Geoinformation Technology, we've started to run Mappathon sessions in those different chapters to introduce our existing volunteers to the concept of missing maps and Mappathons and encourage them to support our international projects. This, of course, gives us a great opportunity for engaging our national staff with our international projects because often even here, Red Cross volunteers on the national scale, they still associate the Red Cross, you know, with the typical blood donations, first aid, um, hospitals, but on a much lesser scale with, with the international work. So Missing Maps um, gives here a great opportunity to leverage um, um, the Mappathons as a format to combine national and international more. Um, and of course, missing maps can also be used as a tool to attract more volunteers. Um, volunteers in general are, yeah, at the moment less likely or, or, yeah, over the time, not that committed to, you know, dedicating a certain amount of time every week, every month, but through missing maps and the mappathons, um, this can be done on a more on an ad hoc basis. You know, people say, okay, I just want to contribute for an evening here or an evening there. Um, you know, this is possible. And then obviously this, you know, can then turn into, you know, those mappathon volunteers becoming Red Cross volunteers. Um, but one thing that should be bear in mind that, um, some of those volunteers might not want to be, um, you know, integrated into a, into a yeah, local chapter. So we're um, planning on also creating like a digital chapter where those volunteers can come together and support 
our Red Cross um, missing maps projects, you know, on a digital level. And of course, this has gained now even more traction with COVID. Our mapathons are now digitally anyway. Um, and so we are really pushing in this direction that, um, yeah, to give people an opportunity to support our projects, you know, in whatever time they've got available. Yeah, that's from my side. Great, Katharina, thank you very much. That was really clear and um, I, I think is really illustrative of some of the potential um, that Missing Maps has in terms of engaging volunteers uh, within the National Society. Um, and I really love the idea of the, di the digital chapter. I think that's a, a new one. And I'm curious to hear everybody's uh, sort of thoughts on your, not only your presentation, but all of our presenters. We have about, uh, well, we have a few minutes to take questions and answers. So we wanna hear, what are you guys excited about? Um, what questions do you have after listening to the presentations? And just go ahead and type your questions into the Zoom chat and I will hand those off to some of my colleagues to answer. Um, so you can go ahead and do that now. Ben, are there any specific in instructions other than type in your questions? Uh, no, no any additional instructions beyond that? Yeah, just make, you can go ahead and I believe you, you have the option to select um, everyone when you're asking your questions. And we, by the way, when, um, when our presenters were talking, there was a couple of great questions that came in around how to actually organize um, mapping parties or mapathons. And there's some information now in the chat window about how to do that. There's a, if you go to the missingmaps.org website, there's lots of information there around um, how you can host a mapathon um, and you can be an individual volunteer or staff member at, um, working with their Red Cross, Red Crescent organization. Um, and, and there's lots of detailed instructions there. You can also reach out to, uh, if you are working for a Red Cross organization, you can also reach out to Elijah um, for assistance. So there's a couple, yeah, just respond to a couple of questions that are coming in. So do you share information with Google Maps or collaborate with Google in any way? Um, so yeah, OpenStreetMap is a separate platform, so it's not, um, it's not linked or affiliated with, with Google in any specific way, uh, but Google has supported disaster mapping efforts in the past in OpenStreetMap through providing satellite imagery or providing some of their crisis um, coordination tools. Uh, but the, the data in OpenStreetMap is separate from the data in Google Maps. Uh, one thing I can say is that many other map providers are working on ways to integrate data from OpenStreetMap into their map products. So, uh, if you look at, for example, Apple Maps, one of the data sources mentioned is OpenStreetMap data. So it really depends on which map provider you're, you're using. Um, yeah, we're happy to take other questions for either for myself or any of our presenters today. You can also just tell us, feel free to introduce yourself and Tell us what you're excited about or what you liked from the presentations. And we'll just give it another minute or two um, if you guys are still typing. And then we're gonna move on to, uh, just after this, we're gonna move on to a bit of an interactive exercise to get into more of the details around how you can actually make this a reality in your country and some of the tangible things that you can do. And we wanna hear your ideas for that as well. Um, great, so there's another question that came in around funding. Um, I can, I can mention that, but if any of my colleagues would like to make a comment on that, please do as well. Um, regarding funding, so Missing Maps um, is a collaborative project. It's really a consortia of organizations. So each organization that participates in Missing Maps, including HOT, including 
um, a number of the Red Cross national societies, including IFRC, are all contributing their own uh, funding sources, their own time and experience to our big goal of filling in, um, filling in data gaps around the world. Um, so we're all bringing our existing relationships and funding sources to that. Um, one of the ones that my colleague David mentioned earlier is uh, a funding source from TED's Audacious Project, which is helping us to make kind of big moves forward towards our goal of mapping an area home to one, one billion people. Um, and so we've had some philanthropic support for that over the past few months from a number of uh, individuals and foundations as well. Uh, would any of my colleagues like to make additional comments on how funding is working in your organizations? Katarina, would you like to go ahead? Or... Yes, sure. Um, so, I mean, we are very lucky. Um, our Missing Maps work is funded through a foundation that also funds the Heigert Institute for Geoinformation Technology, uh, Heidelberg Institute for Geoinformation Technology. Um, and yeah, that covers my role for three years and then we'll see how the financing goes. Um, but as, as a Missing Maps members, or as a Missing Maps member, you then also um, have the opportunity or the possibility to conduct corporate mapper funds through which you know you can potentially finance your work. Katharina or Elijah, there was a few other questions coming in. Would you guys like to address it, either of those? Um, so looking at uh, Juma's question, um, he's asking how the technical aspect can be coordinated if a national society does not have any members of HOT in the country. Um, so we are working, you know, so if we have a missing maps project, for example, we've got one in the Philippines at the moment. Um, we then for the second step, the tra you know, the uh, local mapping, we then train our or yeah, the volunteers of the respective national societies, they get uh, received training in how to conduct the local mapping. So you don't need to have experts there, you know, training will be provided to give the people, you know, the tools they need to then, to then conduct the local mapping. But obviously if there are, um, you know, hot offices in country or youth mappers, for example, or if there is an OSM community in country, we also put the people in touch so they can, you know, support each other. Exactly, and I think that's the kind of that's the point I wanted to to add to what you shared. Um, there are OSM communities, and what this means, there are communities of mappers, communities, uh, teams, and groups of people that contribute to OpenStreetMap. Uh, in many countries, there is usually a community of these mappers, so that would be a very good um, starting point if you're looking into. Um, contributing to OpenStreetMap or setting up some events that can uh, you can use to contribute to OpenStreetMap. David, we had a question coming in from Faith Taran regarding displacement, and I know you and our Uganda team has done some work on that. Um, and whilst we don't map people or individuals directly on the map, there are a lot of things we can do around cross-border movement and displacement. Is there, would you, is there anything you could tell us about um, your work or the Uganda team's work on that? Yeah, sure. Um, that's uh, an interesting one, especially because um, the work we've, we've been doing and working on here in Uganda has been around working with refugees in um, the settlements that they come in. Uh, uh, also working with the host communities to, to map features that are within these host communities as well as within the uh, refugee settlements. Uh, the, the component of movement um, is, is a trick one because um, government agencies primarily are uh, using that information and in many cases that information uh, is, uh, can be tracked down to personal personally identifiable data. So we don't go that far uh, in, in, in mapping, uh, say, where people have come from and um, 
yeah, how they came in as much as that can be mapped, but we don't really put that information in OpenStreetMap um, uh, as we do avoid uh, personal identifying people that um, can eventually uh, be tracked down or uh, that information can be used against these people. But what we've done is really working uh, with local communities, the host communities, the refugee um, pers persons themselves to put uh, features, put uh, services on the map that they they can um, use to, um, you know, to, to, to carry out some of the activities within these communities and, and the settlements. Great, thank you, David. Yeah, for in, in just to maybe add to what you said earlier, we, with displacement, it's really all about helping to map the context around which displacement um, takes place. Um, both both sort of the origins and the destination of displaced people um, and, and mapping the one one other thing that's been done in Uganda is sort of mapping for example border points or informal points of entry and understanding the the facilities and the resources that are at, at those border crossing points um, as well as the services that are available to to refugees or internally displaced people in their new host communities let's um Okay, because of time, we're going to move to the next component of our activity, and I'm going to turn it over to Catalina to lead us through this, but we really wanted to think with all of you for the next 20 minutes or so uh, what this could mean in your countries and talk a little bit about how national societies might be able to take some of the, the learnings from today and sort of scale that up. Um, Catalina, over to you. Thanks. Taylor. So, I mean, I guess with, with all these ideas that were, were shared by my colleagues, you know, like you, you might be like very inspired and um, some of you might be thinking, okay, like, but what do we do next? You know, like what, what can we really concretely do either in our national societies or the organizations that we are coming from to, to contribute to this process? So what we want to do is uh, to invite you actually to a collaborative note-taking document that Benjamin is going to help me to put into the into the chat and the idea is basically just to collect the like basically the collective wisdom from all of you to to get some ideas and and, and to really like think uh, like like deeply you know like on, on key questions that will help us to to make this objective like possible so you can see it, I guess I'm seeing just yeah, some of you are getting into the document. Let us know if you have any issue get into the document. Just click there. I think it's open for everyone. Just get into that. So this is going to be a, a very quick brainstorming from all of you in a Google Doc. So one of the first questions that, that we want to pose to all of you is, is basically how do you see, you no know, like, like the involvement of your national society or your organization, if you work with the IFRC or with the ICRC or with an NGO, you no, know, like I mean, how how do you think to be able to achieve this goal of map the regions and the places that are not mapped? What your organization, you know, that like, could do? So write there all your, you no, know, like anything that comes to your mind that that you think you know that like, will be like like kind of like feasible, realistic from your from your point of view so feel free to write anything if you have like a concrete idea something very specific uh, and you will be happy to actually for us to contact you particularly our whole team or the missing math team just write down then uh, actually the, the the national society or the organization uh, and then and then yeah i think we will be very happy to follow up uh, with you to see you know like what what could be done and i think this builds a little bit on like no, like what, for instance, Katarina shared, no, this idea of the potential digital branches, no, the idea of like what uh, Elijah shared about, no, like mapping for preparedness, training volunteers in advance, uh, and also particularly in the framework of the, of the audacious project, no, like this, that the audacious project, I think, Taylor, is an absolutely brilliant opportunity no, like to really get together to support 94 countries to be mapped. And, and I think what we really want out of this session is to kind of like think, okay, where, I mean, where, where this can happen? What are the potential cooperations that we could, uh, that we could do? 
So yeah, so we have a first, first idea coming from the Swedish Red Cross. So it's great that you have been considering a, no, like getting involved. So that sounds really good. And for the rest of you, don't be shy. Like just write anything that, that you think will be, will be crucial. We have other questions in the meantime, if you feel like to contribute to their questions, like go ahead with that. So this is a, the second question is a really critical one. So we said you know, that basically being an, a, like a mopper could be a really great volunteer activity for a partic particularly for a, for a Red Cross and Red Crescent volunteer. But then what shall we do as a, as a movement, as a humanitarian organization to actually get volunteers excited about it? Like what are exactly all these different like concrete strategies? And, and let's look at it from different perspectives because we can have like, like very high level policy, the kind of like actions that let's say board members, like that the national society itself like could do to really kind of like embed these within the strategies, or it could be not like other type of strategies that, that you think about that could be more kind of like detailed, you know, like how, how to get the people excited. So we can see like there are some great ideas coming up, uh, providing like badges and certificates. Uh, so this is really great, great to see. Maybe introduce in schools as, as youth, so this is a very interesting point, for example. So within the climate uh, ambitions work that we are doing, we are really working quite a lot on what we call youth adapt. And, uh, and actually we are embedding open street math as a, one of those potential activities that volunteers can see as an adaptation kind of activity that they could do. So definitely this idea of, of embed and, and, and really uh, take as an entry point uh, all the youth work that we are doing with adaptation, it's, it's just like absolutely brilliant. Great to see. Excellent. Uh, the third question for the ones who would like to start to look into the third question, it's about a scale. So we have seen from most of the projects that were presented, uh, that we often work on particular, let's say particular villages or particular regions, uh, but we, we don't see the entire countries map or entire risk like areas mapped. So this question is like, how do we take this up to scale? What do we need to, for instance, like take advantage of, 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 of this beautiful opportunity of the audacious like project and missing maps, but to really think big, like to really think on like, how do we make sure that we have many volunteers trained, digital field volunteers. So, so think big about the kind of, you know, like activities. It's like one of the things that comes to my mind is the whole kind of like public and private partnerships into the, into the process at a national level. So yeah, so great. So I, we can see that there are so many ideas coming up. I'm pretty sure Taylor is very happy to see all this coming up because this is going to be very useful for the, for the brainstorming for the audacious project and, and also for the missing my friends that are in the, here in the chat. So this is great. Is there any also... Taylor, any particular idea that are coming up that you like? To follow up. Um, no, I do, I'm just loving seeing the comments from colleagues at Swedish Red Cross and PMI um, regarding some of the initial ideas. And, and uh, we re also recognize many of you on the call today are deeply, deeply involved with mapping already. So thank you, including PMI in Indonesia. Um, so we, we appreciate all the contributions to date and, and thank you for, for mentioning those. Um, I would like to also invite, at the beginning of the call, we, we heard that um, some colleagues that joined us today are working for Red Cross partners or maybe for NGOs outside of the movement. We would like to hear from you as well. Like, what are you, what are you seeing in your organizations and do you see any potential from what you heard about today to scale this within your organizations or do you have additional questions for us? So 
so keep so keep typing. Um, I just wanted to respond really briefly to there was a question in the chat from uh, Shafin Vaya or Va uh, Vala regarding does the UN use your information for refugee displacement? So all of the information that's all, all of the data that's produced in OpenStreetMap gets um, gets exported to the UN's Humanitarian Data Exchange or HDX, and as part of that. Um, the data that we're producing is available to the entire humanitarian community, including information management officers at the UN and working in OCHA, uh, but also any other organization. Um, so um, yes, and that, that happens on a country by country basis. And just to add to that, Taylor, you know, like, like what uh, David shared with us, you know, like, Back in 2010 in Haiti, for instance, OpenStreetMap became like one of the key like data sources for the whole cluster system. So I was working with the shelter cluster at that time and like missing maps, and, like, not missing maps, but like OSM like information was like absolutely the best thing that we could have at that time to do coordination. So this is really used across all types of, of, uh, of organizations in the, in the humanitarian sector and in development. I saw a tweet the other day, Catalina, that said, um, it said 2014, the quote was, wow, that map uses OSM. And then it said 2020, wow, that map does not use OSM. <laughs> um, so it just shows how far we've come. I mean, yeah, as you mentioned, OpenStreetMap really has become the de facto standard across the humanitarian system in terms of um, geos base layers of geospatial data. Um, and it's really because of all, all of you and in, in working at this for many, many years. Um, and, and adding to that, Taylor, which is fascinating, is that it is actually embraced by governments totally. You know, like the government of Indonesia or the Philippines, for instance, have totally embraced OSM as part, not as like one of the elements of their disaster risk reduction and management uh, kind of like data sources. And that's like, that shows basically how powerful yeah, it is. Yeah, I think we, we'd also, we have a few minutes left. We'd also like to invite any of you who'd like to, you can continue typing comments in the document or chat, but if you'd like to make a statement or ask a question verbally, um, we can also, I believe, adjust the settings to allow you to take yourself off mute and do that. But maybe in the meantime, um, you may have a button to either raise your hand or just you can just type the word hand into the chat and we'll we'll try to arrange unmuting you. So feel free to do that at any point. Please make a note in chat if you would like to come off mute. And so for your information on the chat, we have collected different type of like information that you might find very useful in this Padlet, um, how do you call that website? Um, where you have like a lot of the videos and, and, and the, the different things that we have presented in the session today. So Tyler, I can see Nola, so we have really great ideas coming up in the in the collaborative uh, Google Doc. But I think that will be very, very useful. So yeah, you can continue from the typing yeah, them out. Definitely. Yeah, there was a couple of comments made around youth engagement. And just to highlight, um, for those of you on the call today, there is a global network of university students, uh, university student clubs. Who, um, who are made up of students interested in contributing to humanitarian mapping efforts. And that's called Youth Mappers. So you can also check out their, the website at youthmappers.org. And if your organization has youth engagement programs, this is a great way to tap into a network that's already there. And they would love, um, it, it's made up of really enthusiastic young people and university students who want to contribute to humanitarian action and climate adaptation. Uh, climate action. 
So the network's already there. Um, they just want to hear from you in terms of how they can be useful. So check it out, youthmappers.org. Uh, and there's currently more than 200 university chapters in, uh, I don't have the country count, but many, many countries. Catalina, are there any other comments coming in or ideas in the... So in do you have there is one from Faith on the chat, and if you want to look at it, but then overall from the collaborative like document, and yeah, so we have ideas, no, no like proposing like collaborations between like OSM and the Red Cross and and uh, and yeah you see a lot of migration related issues so i think that will be absolutely brilliant to follow up mm. with there is an idea of having a body body system uh, so which is not like linking someone from uh, malawi and, and and germany for example uh, which i guess not like katarina this is one of the ideas that german red cross was also like considering you no know? kind of like how how you no know, like to do kind of like this like peer peer uh, you know, like system between like branches in different countries. Sorry, we're still on mood. Um, yes, exactly. I mean, this is also one of the options also to, you know, increase the exchange between national and international and especially involve the people in the country we are working with, you know, and, and so the national volunteers can, you know, Get a real feel for what what is it actually why they are doing what they are doing you know brilliant yeah i think that would be like super super powerful and um, there was this there is this idea which i think is also very interesting about you no know, like having like focus weeks or more months in which you no know, like volunteers can like really kind of like concentrate on mapping a specific uh you no know, like regions or cities you no know, like which is somehow you no know, like what what missing maps project uh, already does you no know? they do have a task list of like different key places that should be uh, like mapped like in, according to priorities and then kind of like concentrate on those specific uh, areas and um, one of the key issues you no know, is that a lot of that mapping ha happens as Katarina was mentioning, like through the digital volunteers, no? But one of the key important things is the second step. Like, how do we make sure that we have also the on the ground volunteers, which are the ones who are going to kind of like give more granularity to the data that is there? Because with that data, like the power of the data is that it can give some sense of like, a, of, of extra risks. No, like which materials the houses are made of, what is the condition of like water points, no, like which that could only really happen no, like when, when you have like actually direct observation. So, so I think no, like that, that's definitely one of the key areas to continue working on. So Tyler, I think that's for the moment. We have some like, yeah, great ideas coming up there. So I think over to you, we're, I guess, yeah, almost, yeah. yeah, indeed. Um, thanks to everyone who contributed their ideas. And if you have something that's coming to mind in the last few minutes, just please add it to the document, even if it's a question or just your contact info, if you want to, um, if you want to join the, our mailing list and just um, sort of keep up to date. So thank you very much. We'll bring our session to a close. But I, before we do that, I want to ask for maybe a final comment from each of our speakers today. Um, and I, I would like you all each to think about if you had sort of one message that you want to leave with the audience or one, one takeaway or um, just, a, just a final comment in about a minute or so each, what would that be? What's the action you'd like to inspire today? Um, and David, I'll go to you first. Thank you, Taylor. Um, I think this next decade is going to be very, very important in 
in many ways and we've just had um, the past year being unique. Um, at the end of the decade, we are looking at the sustainable development goals um, set to 20, uh, 2030. Um, but in between there, the audacious project, and that's what I would like to point everyone to, um, this is a unique effort, I think, that is going to help us to get um, many of these locations that um, um, are not yet on the map, uh, to have them on the map. And I'm going to share a link here that you can um, just check out uh, more about the Audacious project on the HOT website um, and let's map the world together. Thank you, David. Great closing comment there. Elijah, over to you. What would you like participants to take away from the session today? Uh, thank you, Taylor. Uh, mine will be just to encourage everyone to be a mapper. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's at, as you say, it is, as you, as you say just so you just need a laptop and you can be an open strip champion. Thank you. Thank you, Elijah. Katerina. Yeah, I think I follow on exactly what Elijah has said because I know from you know our volunteers at the beginning they find it a bit daunting. You know, they've never worked with satellite images and now they are you know asked to map. You know, but then once they make a start, you know, they see how much fun it is and you know just all have a stab at it and it's actually very easy and everyone can do it. You heard it from a cartographer, so <laughs> thank you, Katrina. Uh, Catalina. Good, so the, my key message is directed to the fact that we have the examples of how powerful it is, uh, but to take this up to scale, we really need senior leadership. We need secretary generals. We need like the board members. We need like people to really understand the importance that this represents for, for the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement. And I think you know, like a lot of the people that is here in this chat, you know, like you can definitely become those ambassadors, depending on where you're working, you know, like to make sure that we can make changes at that policy level that is necessary, but then at an operational and practical level. And, and that basically with the key message that at the end, this is really a contribution to climate action. And it's a really kind of like fantastic contribution to it. I'm sharing on the chat here, the Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement Climate Ambitions. So you can have good material there to support this. Great, thank you, Catalina. Um, and thank you for sharing that notepad as well with uh, lots, of, lots of great links there. Um, great, so with that, we'll close our session for today. I'd like to thank all of you for joining, especially my colleagues from um, Missing Maps Consortia organizations and also from uh, also HOP members. Um, but thank you to each of you. Thank you for your ideas and comments. And we really look forward to working together uh, in the future. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, night, um, or mornings. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Thanks to you, Taylor, and the rest of the whole team. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you ah, so much. One more, we forgot one more very important thing, Taylor. We have a follow up session later on like really important to go into the details of a lot of examples about missing maps. So it's gonna be a little bit late, but maybe good for the people in the Americas and in Asia Pacific. So Elijah is gonna take us through later on all the wealth of examples of the work that we are doing. Uh, thanks Catalina. If you're looking for that session, it's taking place at 4.30 p.m. New York time or 22.30 Geneva time. Uh, so if you're in if you're in Europe, Africa, or Asia, um, it's for your for you night owls. If you're in the U.S., it's probably a, a better time. It's called community mapping to enhance disaster preparedness and response. So take a look for that in the agenda session number two hundred nine. Uh, thank you, everyone, and hope you have a great rest of the day or evening. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.